Hi, I'm Dr. Renee Turchi, Plymouth White Marsh High School Distinguished Graduate and Pediatrician at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, and you're watching CITV. Students and staff, thank you for being here for the 2019 Distinguished Graduates uh, Ceremony. Um, I'm going to officially introduce, if you could all please stand, and big welcome back, round of applause for our inductees this year. We have 1971 graduate, Ms. Dr. James Albert. And 1991 graduate, Mr. Randall. Brenner, welcome and congratulations. You can all please remain standing and we will for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you may be seated. Once again, welcome um, and thank you for being here. I, I tr truly appreciate it. I know how uh, inundated and busy teachers, students are this time of year with um, obviously Keystone exams behind us, but AP exams as well as preparing for final exams, which is in a couple of weeks. But one time a year together, we recognize inductees and hopefully be one of you here in the crowd um, who are remarkable, distinguished as graduates here from Plymouth White Marsh High School. And we have two here today that we're going to recognize. We're fortunate to have uh, many members here also in the crowd uh, regarding family, friends, alumni. I want to recognize them at this moment. Um, to my left, um, she's part of the DGO committee and a school board representative. We have Mrs. Moore. Also to my left is the president of the Stingers Graduate Organization and alumni, Mr. Mark Hutchinson. And we also have uh, Dr. Christian, our superintendent of schools here today. He's putting his other hat on, ensuring that another building is, is, is doing fine. So he's taking care of business on that end, but he's here supporting our inductees here as well today. In the crowd, we also have Mrs. Kathy Peduzzi, another school board member. <laughs> Mrs. Jennifer Dow, school board member. And Mrs. Leslie Feingold. Thank you for the support. And we also have previous distinguished graduates in attendance here today. Um, Mr. Joe Daly, professional golfer. Over lunch, Mr. Daly shared with me that his ball playing against Tiger Woods was just on par with him when he played a few rounds of golf with the Tiger Woods. It was a great story to hear. Um, we also have Lieutenant General Dennis Benchoff. Welcome. Mr. Gary Johnson. Mr. Ed Swetkowski. Dr. Pat Ionelli, who's also a distinguished graduate committee representative, former administrator here in the district. Welcome back. And Mr. Jim Don Don Donofrio, as we all know. Let's also like to recognize Mr. Dave Sherman. He's in attendance as well as Mrs. Marks. They're both ad hoc members of the committee. Um, they help uh, the committee a tremendous amount in ensuring that we're prepared for this day and securing high quality alumni that we have here over here to my right. 
So what's the purpose and, and why are we here today? We have just two outstanding inductees here. So each year the committee convenes, we, we meet and review a tremendous amount of applications that come through into our office that are graduates. If you look in the past, we've had Matt Britton, social media entrepreneur, John Salmons, a professional basketball player last year at Darrell Scott. Um, we, have, we have a variety of alumni in many, many different areas of academics, arts, athletics, business, humanities, and public service that serve as examples of excellence for the community and you as students. Today, we have the honor of inducting two outstanding distinguished graduates here at Plymouth White Marsh High School, Dr. James Albert, class of 1971, and Mr. Randall Brenner, class of 1991. As I mentioned, they're two outstanding graduates who have the opportunity to tell their story and hopefully be an inspiration for you. During their time at Plymouth White Marsh High School, they worked diligently as students in the classroom, a tremendous amount in the classroom. However, as we mentioned to you, when you enter here at Plymouth White Marsh High School, they were also heavily involved outside the classroom with extracurricular activities in sports and academic clubs. Students today take advantage of this opportunity and listen intently to their unique experiences, how they follow their passion throughout their successes and challenges in their careers. The inductees are not only, quote unquote, the best of the best, but their stories and experiences speak to their passion in their field, challenges they embrace, and how they inspire everyone around them. We hope this afternoon they'll inspire you. Thank you. We're looking forward to an outstanding ceremony, and I'm going to turn it over to the president of the DGO organization, Mr. Mark Hutchinson. Thank you. Welcome students, family members, faculty, and honored guests. This is the 34th year that our organization has been recognizing and honoring PW graduates who have distinguished themselves in their chosen careers following their years here at Plymouth White Marsh. And today, as Dr. Bacani has said, we're extremely happy to have two more very distinguished individuals who have come here today to be so honored. We encourage you to listen to what they have to say, listen to how their years of study and participation in the activities here at PW, what role those experiences had in the careers that they chose. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first student presenter, Anastasia Chetnevich. Good afternoon, staff and students of Plymouth White Marsh High School. My name is Anastasia Chetnevich, and today I have the pleasure of introducing one of our very own distinguished graduates, Mr. Jim Albert. After graduating from PW in 1971, Mr. Albert went on to pursue a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Bucknell University, followed by a master's degree and a doctorate in statistics from Purdue University. He works as both a professor at Bowling Green State University in Ohio and as an author. Having written or co-written 14 books, Mr. Albert has discovered a way to unite his interest in baseball with his studies on the applications of statistics. When asked about his career, he observed that it's truly remarkable that he can continue his passion for baseball simply by doing research in baseball. Some of Mr. Albert's most distinguished literary works include Statistical Thinking in Sports, published in 2007, Visualizing Baseball, published in 2017, and Curveball, Baseball Statistics and the Role of Chance in the Game, which received the Sporting News Society for American Baseball Research Award in 2001. He has also been recognized as a fellow of the American Statistical uh, Association and recently received the Association's Founder Award in 2015 for his service and dedication. Additionally, Mr. Albert was named a Distinguished University Professor at Bowling Green State University in 2018. With such a long and notable career, it's no surprise that Mr. Albert is joining us today to be recognized as a distinguished graduate. His academic and mathematical achievements, coupled with his passion for baseball, have allowed students and sporting fans alike to analyze the game from an entirely new perspective. That is why it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jim Albert. In 1979, when Dr. James Albert joined BGSU in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, he likely hadn't calculated the odds of one day making it to the big leagues in his profession. And yet, nearly 40 years later, that's exactly what he's done. In baseball, they call it making it to the show. But in this case, you might say the show has made its way to him. 
a dedicated educator, creative researcher, and prolific writer with an amazing 14 books and 104 journal articles to his credit. Dr. Albert's work has been cited almost 7,000 times, with 2,500 of those coming in the last six years. Impressive numbers, even for one of the most admired statisticians in the game. Still, those stats alone don't tell the whole story. To his math students, he's a passionate educator and an inspiring advocate who incorporates innovative technology and encourages hands-on experimentation in the classroom. To his colleagues, Jim Albert's work with sports data is thought to be among the finest in the world. And to his peers at BGSU, he's one of those rare five-tool teachers who has contributed something special to every phase of university life through workshops, publications, grants, advanced scholarship, and beyond. No doubt, he's a starter on any statistician's lineup card. Here at BGSU, our newest entry reads simply, Dr. James Albert, Distinguished University Professor. Here are some highlights of my academic career. At PW, I didn't really know what I'd be doing with my math interest, but today I've been fortunate to be able to combine two of my interests. One is baseball and one is learning from data. I'm a Bayesian statistician, which is essentially is a special way of learning from data. Here's a simple example of Bayes' rule. There was some dispute recently about who wrote the song in my life. Was it Paul McCartney or John Lennon? Well, the way we think about this is that either John or Paul wrote the song and would give each person a probability of one half. We collect some data, which is the um, which are the chord transitions of the song, and then you determine with high probability that John Lennon wrote the song. I've done some work in baseball and statistics, and we wrote this book called Curveball, which is our effort to explain uh, statistical reasoning in the context of baseball. Intro stats has always been a difficult course to teach, partly because the students don't really like the examples we use. So I tried something different. I decided to write to teach a course completely from a baseball perspective. I love the program and uh, I use the open source language R. And uh, so I've put together, we put together a book which describes how you can look at the, all the large group of baseball data and do some interesting analyses by using the package R. Back in 71, I loved to play tennis and I played uh, on the tennis team. And uh, fortunately, I can continue to play tennis uh, today. And also I've been able to combine my work as a statistician with tennis and I'm starting to do some research in tennis analytics. Glasses on. <laughs> okay. Well, I feel very honored um, to be here to receive a second edition from the Distinguished uh, Graduates Association. I've always been felt very grateful going to Plymouth White Marsh, and it's quite an honor to be included among all the alumni who received this award. Now, looking back at my days at PW, I was a math and science student, and I really, um, looking back at um, my life in math and um, PW, some things haven't changed, and some things really have changed. One thing that hasn't changed is that we basically take the same courses. I took algebra, college algebra one and two. I took um, uh, geometry, trigonometry. We didn't have calculus yet, so I took a finite math course as a senior. But um, one thing that's definitely changed is um, how we compute things. Uh, when I was a, a trigonometry student, my tool was a slide rule, which you may have not haven't seen before, <laughs> and um, which was actually it was pretty exciting having a slide rule. I could compute logs and. Uh, multiple things pretty fast. Uh, electronic calculator just came out when I was a senior, and the first, uh, the first calculators that came out were just four functions, just uh, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. And I was really, really excited when we got the square root key. That was a big deal <laughs> those years. So um, those days, that kind of calculator cost $100. Um, so when I, I like math at PW, but really, honestly, I had really had no idea what I'd be doing in math. And um, so I, I learned about statistics primarily through my days as an undergraduate. I was a math major at Bucknell, 
and was very fortunate that there were people there who sort of steered me toward a statistical career, which I really didn't know much about. So I was very naive. And I find that um, students nowadays are, are similar. They aren't really sure what they want to do with math. But um, so people nowadays, students nowadays, they, they like math. They aren't really sure what to do with it. So anyway, so for a student who likes math, here are some, some suggestions. Um, first thing, if you like math and you go to college, take as much math as you can. Because really, math is a great foundation for a lot of subjects. And so take all the calculus, take linear algebra. That really is going to help you down the road. Um, second thing is um, I notice now that um, PW offers a bunch of computer science courses. We didn't have that opportunity when I was a high school student. But if you like to program and you like data, like working with data, then a, a new field which is emerging is called data science, which basically uh, combines programming and, and mathematics and statistics. And that's really a wide field. So I think. Um, you know, that's a great area. You can apply data science in almost every, every discipline, and that, that's wonderful. Um, so opportunities for math are really good, although it may not be obvious at first. Um, I have a lot of students um, who, again, are like math and aren't sure what to do with it. I even have people that want to work for a sports team. Now, I used to say, well, that's nice, but there aren't any jobs in sports. Well, I don't say that anymore because there are tons of jobs in sports. And if you've got the passion for a sport and you want to work with math, then I've got friends who work for basketball teams, work for hockey teams, work for football teams and baseball. So the opportunities are, are good and they're, they're just growing. Um, so I was very fortunate in my life to go from math to statistics to data science. So well, the, the great thing is that you are, you're starting with a great foundation. Because I think when I, I was very lucky to be at PW because the foundation they gave me was great for going on. And likewise, I think you're doing very well here and you, you're well suited for, for excelling in any kind of math related field. Um, it's really an exciting time for you. Um, opportunities using math are all, everywhere. Um, one thing that um, students now have the opportunity is there are many opportunities for internships. And because really what you do is you get to watch people who are actually applying math in different ways and you learn quite a bit from looking those people work, and also those internships often lead to jobs. So um, anyway, so thanks again for this recognition. Um, I really, I'm an academic, and um, I, can't, I don't think of my job as work at all. I really love what I do. I get to work on baseball, get to do research in baseball, uh, which is remarkable. I get to do, you know, work with students. Um, I, we're developing a new data science uh, program at Bowling Green, um, and so, you know, it's really, I've been very, very fortunate in my life to have that opportunity. And of course, it all started from being at PW. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor to have such a privilege to introduce one of this year's 2019 Distinguished Graduates and my father, Randy Brenner. Randy attended Plymouth Boy Marsh High School as a teen and graduated in the class of 1991. In his 28 years since graduating from Plymouth White Marsh, Randy has worked his way up in the pharmaceutical industry in which he has held many executive and leadership positions to help bring medicines to people all across the world. This has impacted their lives for the better. In high school, he was inspired by his chemistry teacher, Mr. Ray, to pursue a career in the sciences and attributes his work to him. There's so much more I would like to tell you guys about my father, and in order to do so, I've made a video to introduce him more and show you guys a little bit more about his life. My name is Randy Brenner, a proud graduate of Plymouth White Marsh High School, class of 1991. I live in the local community. I'm a proud father of three children in the Colonial School District. I'm a scientist uh, who brought my passion from science from a high school chemistry teacher at Plymouth White Marsh High School, and I've spent my career trying to bring new medicines to patients around the world. Randy attended the Colonial School District since he started school in kindergarten. Randy attended elementary school at Highfield Elementary and Plymouth Elementary. He also attended Colonial Middle School where he played football, basketball, and baseball. 
and of course, he attended Plymouth White Marsh for high school. Randy started at PW in 1987. He was there for all four years and graduated in 1991. It was at Plymouth White Marsh High School in the fall of 1988 where he met his now wife and, of course, my mother, Deborah Delano Brenner. You know, I, I, there's not one specific time I remember uh, meeting Randy or Deb. I, I just know this, that, that when a teacher starts in their first year, uh, the class doesn't really take to them very kindly. Randy, in my second year, uh, he was very friendly and opening and accepting of who I was and what it is that I was doing. And I, I feel like that, that whole thing set the tone for not only our relationship, but for the, you know, the success that we had in the program and in the class at the time. At PW, he continued his family legacy to PW Athletics, with his sister being a cheerleader in the class of 1988, and his brother Andy also playing basketball and being the captain of the 1987 boys basketball team. Also, his father was one of the biggest PW basketball fans and is now honored in the athletic garden outside of the brand new gym. Randy played PW basketball in his four years at PW with varsity in his 11th and 12th grade years and being captain of the varsity team in 1991, which lost in the quarterfinals of states to a tough Harrisburg team. Right now, Randy Brenner goes to the foul line for Plymouth White Marsh. This is where it's, this is what it's all about. They've got to make their foul shots, and 53, Randy Brenner just can't. Get up, Nate. Get up. Gracie. Brenner pokes it away. Here comes Brenner driving in on the break. Brenner drives, scoops, sad score. Randy Brenner asserting himself on defense. Randy wasn't the most talented player, but he was the smartest. Whenever we inbounded the ball, Randy was the inbounder. He always made the right decisions going against the defenses. He could read defenses very well. Whenever we pressed teams, he was always in the right spot. And then whenever we got pressed, he was our inbounder. He always made the smartest decisions to break the press and was very unselfish with his teammates, always passing the ball to the open man. While in high school, Randy was inspired by his high school chemistry teacher, Mr. Ray, to pursue a career in the sciences. I don't remember a lot about many of my teachers in high school, but I will never forget Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray was my chemistry teacher, and the one I think back about the most as I think about my career choices post the, uh, the late 90s uh, and into college and beyond. Mr. Ray was a chemistry teacher that I had two years at uh, Plymouth White Marsh, once uh, in my 10th grade year and then again in my senior year when I took AP Chemistry. I always think of him as being ahead of his time. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, high school was very textbook driven. Curriculums, teachers used textbook. Mr. Ray was the first teacher I ever had from a curriculum perspective that didn't use a textbook. He had a, such, such a passion, a drive, a love for everything chemistry that that really just worked its way into me. And when I thought about college and what I wanted to do, that's why I started studying life sciences and chemistry moving forward. His mother, who was a teacher for many years in the Colonial School District, instilled the importance of education into all of the Brenner children. After high school, Randy attended Muhlenberg College where he was a chemistry major and graduated in 1995 with a Bachelor of Sciences in Chemistry. Throughout the course of his early career, Randy worked on teams to help bring several important new medicines to patients. These include products such as Rotashield, which is a child vaccine for a disease called rotavirus, Rapimune, an immunosuppressant agent for patients who receive solid organ transplants to help ensure their bodies don't reject the new organs, and many more medicines. Randy also spent a good part of his career working in the field of antibiotics, which as you likely have heard, remain a huge public health crisis due to the development of antibiotic resistance. It was in 2004 where he helped lead a team to the approval of a product called Tigasol, an IV-only antibiotic for serious hospital infections. Arguably, his greatest social impact throughout his career was the time he spent leading the regulatory efforts at Pfizer focusing on the Asian and Latin America emerging markets. This included a strong focus on bringing new drugs and currently available drugs to patients in developing regions of whom many have no access to modern and safe medicine. Shortly after my time working in the labs in the pharmaceutical industry, I realized that I wanted to do something bigger and had a bigger impact on the, the industry as a whole. 
So I left lab work and, and transitioned into something called regulatory work. Uh, regulatory affairs is the discipline that works very closely with the boards of health, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., the European Medicines Agency in Europe, and lots in, of other uh, agencies around the world to ensure that the drug development process follows the regulations that are laid out by these agencies and at the end of a very, very big investment that pharmaceutical companies can ultimately get their products approved and available to patients. So my early part of my career, I focused mostly on the U.S., trying to bring new medicines to patients in the U.S., and then quickly transitioned into an international role where I had the great opportunity to work with people literally all over the world. Um, After leaving Pfizer, Randy spent four years with a company called Shire where he worked in the area of rare diseases, neuroscience, GI, and ophthalmology where he contributed to the development and regulatory process of a number of important new medicines, such as ones that helped out with ADHD and Crohn's disease. Shire was also one of the largest rare disease companies developing products for very small patient populations that historically have been neglected. Uh, through this activities, I had the opportunity to work with uh, boards of health, the World Health Organization and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help really bring new medicines to Sub-Saharan Africa and third world countries around the world. After Shire, Randy wanted to get back to his early roots and started at a small biotech startup as part of the executive team of a small company called Paratech with the vision of bringing new oral and IV antibiotics to patients in need. Randy is a very special leader within our organization. Uh, he's someone that not only has expertise within helping us and guiding us on, on terms of uh, the regulatory pathway as well as overseeing our manufacturing space. Uh, in addition to that, Randy is uh, really an enterprise-wide leader that uh, helps guide many individuals uh, throughout the company to continue their uh, momentum, continue their passion, and uh, see, what, see that uh, what we're working on is really uh, valuable to society. The Brenner family continues the Colonial School District tradition with three kids following through in mom and dad's footsteps. Randy continues his give back to the local community through his time and dedication to the youth sports in White Marsh Township. He has coached all of his kids in many sports and is on the board of White Marsh Girls Basketball where he gives a significant amount of time helping shape the next group of Plymouth White Marsh student athletes. He has also been actively involved over the past 20 years in raising money for the MS Society, which is a debilitating disease that impacts someone in his family. I'm honored to be here today and to be selected as a distinguished graduate from Plymouth White Marsh High School. <laughs> wow, that was great. <clears throat> I feel like maybe I don't need to say anything now. That video pretty much told the whole story of my life. But um, uh, super proud of you, Lenny, for doing that. Uh, it certainly means a lot to me. Um, I don't know if you guys have had a, a, a child of, a, of an inductee uh, introduce them and, and make a video for them before. But um, for me, it was super special. So thank you. I, that, that means a lot. Um, I'd also like, just uh, before we finish on the video, just also thank uh, Mr. McWilliams. He was in the video as well. I don't actually know if he's in the room today. Uh, Mr. McWilliams was my CITV teacher and is now uh, Lenny's CITV teacher. So um, it's really special to see uh, that, that relationship continuing and, and the time and the effort that he put into helping uh, the video and giving Lenny time in class to do that. So Mr. Mick, if you're out there, uh, Blinding Lights, if you're out there, thank you very much, as well as Mr. Peeler, who I know uh, gave some time uh, to help Lenny as well. Um, Certainly want to thank the committee. Uh, super special day for me. Uh, I love Plymouth White Marsh High School. I've, I've been in this area my whole life. Uh, so to be inducted today uh, really means a lot. So special thanks to everybody on the committee, um, everybody here today, uh, school board members, et cetera. Thank you. It's a really special day for me. I also like to thank my family. <clears throat> I'm, I, I look, looking out in here, I see, obviously, I see a lot of Lenny's friends. Some of the little boys you saw in the, in the photo at the end are all grown up young men here now. Uh, but I think anybody that knows my family knows that the Brenners travel in a pack. Um, and this is no different. Uh, whether you see us on a baseball field on a rainy afternoon and 12 of us show up, or you're, you just happen to be stuck on an airplane with us going on vacation, and there's 20 of us that pile on in matching shirts, um, this, this uh, family sticks to the community. We stick together. So I'm thankful for the, I don't know the number, 12 or 15 uh, friends or family that are out there uh, supporting me today and uh, all wanted to come here today. So uh, I want to thank everyone for that. Um, of course, uh, I want to thank my mom. I 
I think she's, there she is up front. Um, Lenny mentioned a little bit uh, about the focus of education in our family. Um, and my mom was a teacher here in Colonial School District. Um, she went on to, to do other entrepreneurial things as well as ended up back in teaching in Philadelphia. But foundational to, I think, my success and what I'll cover a little bit in, in a few minutes is the idea of continue education and continue learning. Um, so uh, the, th those concepts have really helped make me make changes in my career, take on new challenges. So uh, obviously wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you, Mom, so thank you. Um, uh, also just, you know, you saw the, uh, the, the memory uh, plaque to my dad out in the, uh, the garden outside. Um, so uh, of course I wish he were here today. Um, he was a fan of many of the boys in this room. He actually coached many of the boys in this room and uh, spent many, many days in, uh, in the gyms at Plymouth White Marsh uh, watching basketball games, not just mine, but many of the others over the last 25 years. PW really is an important place in my life. Uh, I spent a little bit of time with Mr. Young down in the, uh, in the reception earlier and some others as we were walking, walking back about how special it is to actually settle back into the community that you grow up in. And it really is. It's, it's an amazing feeling to walk into a Wawa and see a friend from high school. Uh, last week I was on a field trip for my fifth grader and there were a couple other uh, uh, parents there who I graduated with from high school. Um, it's really nice everywhere you walk, you sort of keep those memories alive and they continue to grow. Um, you know, I've sat in the seats that you guys are sitting in right now uh, many, many years ago as a student, but also as a parent um, and uh, awards assemblies or back to school nights. Um, so, you know, it really does hold a special place in my heart and in some ways it feels like we never left even though I did go away for a short four years uh, during college. Um, as you saw in the video, uh, and Lenny mentioned a little bit, uh, is you know, I do have a very motivating memory from Plymouth White Marsh High School, and that is of my high school chemistry teacher, Mr. Ray. Uh, he really did inspire a passion that was uh, amazing. And then while Lenny was talking about him, uh, Jim had mentioned that he remembered Mr. Ray as well. Right? So we both had him for, uh, for high school chemistry. Um, and his passion and his drive and his commitment to teaching something that he loved, doing something that he loved, uh, brought the, the passion of science into me, but also wanted me to accomplish something in life that I too could enjoy doing, that I could love, that I could be proud of uh, in everything I do and, and going to work every day. So I speak about him often, it's 30 years later since being in high school, but he still has a force um, in my life and the, the way I approach life and the things that I do. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I'm gonna be a regulatory expert and an executive in a pharmaceutical company one day. Having an 11th grader who's thinking about college and thinking about choices in life, you know, we often talk about, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? Most kids in this room don't know. Many that think they know will probably end up doing something slightly different than what you think you want to do. Foundational to what you love, but something different than what you want to do. My story is no different. Um, I, I left Plymouth White Marsh in 1991 uh, with a passion to do something in science. I went to Muhlenberg College, as Lenny laid out in the video, which is a small private school in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And during that time there, had full intentions of going to medical school. Uh, that was my plan, uh, go to college, spend four years, go pre-med, go on to medical school. Shortly after my time there, I realized uh, that that really wasn't the path I wanted to take. Life is full of, of uh, road bumps, life is full of dead ends, dead ends where you have to make turns and, and, and go a different direction. So I decided to go a different direction. Uh, I don't regret any decisions, uh, but I did decide to go to a different direction. And med school wasn't right for me. So I shortly uh, after college started working in a research lab. Uh, what is a research lab? I didn't know at the time. I knew I was a science major. That there wasn't a lot of things I was qualified to do leaving uh, college other than working in a scientific field. So I took a job at a company called Wyeth Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Wyeth no longer exists today, but it was a terrific company that I worked for. And I started as something called a staff chemist. And as a staff chemist, I was working in a lab trying to take uh, one of the flagship products of the company break it apart and identify metabolites. So uh, metabolism happens when you swallow a drug, trying to identify metabolites that could be active um, to help the company further develop more products. And shortly after that time, I realized that lab work was fun, but it was something I didn't want to do uh, for a long period of time. So uh, I, I quickly did something I suggest that everybody does in every, every span of life, which is started to network, talk to people, ask questions. Uh, you can learn a lot from asking questions see what else is out there. And I quickly learned that the pharmaceutical industry in particular is this giant uh, opportunity for people with a science backgrounds, with statistical backgrounds, with business backgrounds, with marketing backgrounds. It's an industry amongst itself that provides a great opportunity for people to get not only get good jobs, 
but at the end of the day, actually feel like you're making a difference uh, and impacting patients and, and patients' lives. So uh, that was my journey into the pharmaceutical industry. I found my way through, through many different companies that, that, that Lenny mentioned. Um, I've only worked for three in my entire life, which is, uh, I think, a small number for, for somebody um, who's worked as long as I have. Um, <clears throat> I've had great opportunities to bring new medicines to patients in the U.S., uh, to patients outside the U.S. Some of them, uh, Lenny mentioned, uh, there's many, many, many more, thankfully, that I was able to contribute to the development of. I've had great opportunities to work with interesting uh, agencies like the World Health Organization, trying to tackle problems of, in sub-Saharan Africa where there's a, a severe underserved population, where even the infrastructure makes getting medicines hard there, and then how do you treat mass populations who have no health care, no infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and then now, uh, I've triggered to trying to tackle um, another big public health problem, which is the current problem of anti antimicrobial resistance. Let's just take a, a little poll. So the, everyone in the room, raise your hand if you've ever taken an antibiotic. I would expect everyone's hand to go up. Um, this year alone, in the US, there'll be two million people that go to the doctor or go to a hospital to take an antibiotic, and it will not work. Um, they will have developed antibiotic-resistant uh, infections. The antibiotics will no longer work. Doctors will try more. Those may or may not work. Doctors try more. Those may or may not work. And at the end of all this, somewhere between 25 and 35,000 of those patients will die um, because of something we take for granted, which is the discovery of penicillin, the discovery of tetracyclines. Uh, we take it for granted that you go to the doctor, you take a pill, it'll, it'll work. Well, the bacteria are smarter than the scientists, and, and, and they are winning. So it is a big problem we have out there. So I, I joined Paratech, which is a company really focused on developing new antibiotics and bringing new medicines to patients um, to treat these uh, severe resistant infections. And uh, one of the most proud accomplishments of my life is uh, the recent approval of a product we have there uh, called Nuzira. Many people work in the pharmaceutical industry their whole life and, and can't have the privilege of bringing a product to the market. Um, many people who do still bring products to the market never actually work on a product that they may actually take. Um, so this is a pretty exciting time for us as a company, a time for me uh, to be successful in doing that. Um, everyone in this room will have a chance to make an impact on society. <clears throat> uh, your teachers make an impact on you every day. The administration makes an impact on you every day. Um, you see it from, from, from my history and the impact my teacher made on me. Um, you know, I, it, I don't want to sound like the parent in the room, but it's certainly up to each of one of you to, to figure out how to, what your road looks like and, and how you get there. Um, but that's all great, and uh, that's one of the reasons PW was important to me. Um, but there's one, you know, the, the main reason that, that PW is most important to me. How, how many of the students in the room right now have a boyfriend or girlfriend that goes to Plymouth White Marsh? Wow, not a lot of them out there. Um, <laughs> So, so as Letty mentioned, um, you know, PW was the place where I met my girlfriend in, uh, in uh, ninth and 10th grade and uh, my now wife, uh, Deborah, who's out in the audience. Um, right outside these doors, it was a back to school night. Um, I think it was 1988, uh, where we were both, I think they called them chaperones or the ones that stand around answering questions that parents may have. Um, and we just started talking during a break. And that was literally the start of a now 30 year uh, fairy tale romance and um, uh, and uh, so, so that is my most important memory of, of Plymouth White Marsh High School. Uh, Deb has, of course, had a major influence on my life uh, because we started dating so long as had been influential in every decision I've made. So, of course, I want to thank, uh, thank Deb uh, for everything you've done to help guide me into the person I am and, uh, and uh, the, the helping me uh, you know, achieve everything I've achieved and, and ultimately receive this award. So thank you. I really appreciate it, honey. Um, So just in, in closing, um, you know, you, I think you can feel the, the passion I have towards this school and this school district. PW did guide me academically. It provided me with the, the tools I needed to be successful in life. Um, most importantly now, it will guide my children as they come through the district, um, uh, 11th grader, an 8th grader, and a 5th grader. Um, so I I'm, I'm I'm, I'm couldn't be happier to be part of this school district and part of the community. Honored, really honored to receive this award. Congratulations to Jim, and thanks to everybody for, for selecting me and honoring me for here today. Thank you. One big round of applause once again for inductees, Dr. Albert and Mr. Brenner. I'd also like to thank Lenny and Anastasia, just a tremendous job introducing our inductees. Please give them a round of applause. 
switch gears and transition a bit and make it a little more personal, we do have some crafty questions by our students. And led by Mr. Gallagher, if you want to come on up, Mr. Gallagher. Big round of applause for Mr. Gallagher. We all know him. I'm going to ask the inductees if you could. Would you like them down low, Mr. Gallagher? Okay. Mm -hmm. We've got the two inductees, Mr. Brenner, Dr. Alba, come on down and help us out, answer some oh, questions. Okay. Want to pick your brain? How you doing? Thank oh, you. Wherever, wherever you're comfortable. Right here is perfect. Thank, uh, no, actually, I don't know whether these are working or not. We'll fix it. I'll just run around a lot with the mic. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Mr. Gallagher here at Plymouth White Marsh, and I've got my great Block 5 with me today. And I hope you're enjoying the program so far, and I hope that you're going to take a lot of inspiration from the wisdom and experience and insight and accomplishment of our honorees today. Um, and I hope that it encourages you in the long run to cast your own optimistic eye toward the future as you achieve your own hopes and dreams after Plymouth White Marsh. The possibilities are so endless as you've seen, and uh, typically you don't end up where you think you're going to go. So we'll open up our questioning session today uh, with a question for Mr. Albert uh, from Evan Elgart. Mr. Elgart, if you please. Uh, so my question is, how do you use statistics to model how many wins an MLB team might get in a season, and do the Phillies have a chance of winning the World Series this year? Okay, well, um, baseball is interesting. You can model the number of games you win by, it's gotta be a combination of some sort of offensive measure, some sort of defense, a pitching measure, and also defense. So I think the Phillies are gonna win a lot of games this year, and I think they will make the playoffs, but once you make the playoffs, <laughs> all bets are off, because <laughs> really, the, the postseason is just a big crapshoot, really. So they may get lucky, they got lucky twice, so it might happen again. Thank you very much. Craps is a dice game, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, next question will be for Mr. Brenner uh, by Ms. Nikki Sergio. Could we have Ms. Nikki Sergio? Okay, what is the greatest challenge you face as Senior Vice President of Paratech Pharmaceuticals and how would you advise someone trying to secure a high level executive position in any venue? Okay, great, oh, thank you. So, so two questions there. Uh, so the biggest challenge, so the, uh, for those thinking of going into the pharmaceutical industry, the, the drug approval process is extremely complicated. It takes a very, very long time to get a drug approved. It takes a lot of money, you know, anywhere between $500 million to a billion dollars to bring one drug to market. The regulatory pathway is complex and challenging. So uh, taking a product through an early phase development all the way through clinical development into the regulatory process into approval has a number of hurdles along the way. And, um, you know, time, it takes time, takes a lot of expense, uh, and takes a lot of good luck in many ways as well. As far as, uh, um, what was the second part of your question? How, do you recommend, how would you become a, a senior vice president in a and How you'd advise company? an upcoming um, executive? I, I think, you know, my general motto in life is to find something you love to do, become an expert in it, and then work your butt off uh, to be successful in it. And I think, you know, my story's no different, right? And I would suggest the same thing to anybody else. Um, as I said, nobody will wake up tomorrow morning thinking they want to be a regulatory expert and an executive in a company. I strongly suggest you find something you love to do, figure out a way to become an expert in it, and then work hard to, to accomplish your goals. Thank you. And for Mr. Albert, we have Emerson Abramovich. Um, my question is, did you play baseball, and how has analyzing statistics changed the way you look at the game? Okay, I was, um, growing up, I did play Little League Baseball, but I have to tell you, I, my, prim my primary position was right field. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they, that was the least likely place for a ball to land, so I was playing right field. So I don't think I learned much about, play, uh, but I am a tennis player, and um, so when you play tennis, there's a lot of strategy. You think a lot about your opponent and what their weaknesses is. So I think um, baseball is the same kind of thing. You you explore you know how your how your uh, your opponent plays and you learn a lot about their tendencies. It's the same kind of thing. Thank you. And for Mr. Brenner, we have Tara Al Salim. 
Hi, so from both the commercial and philanthropic perspective, upon which current pressing health issue could the pharmaceutical industry exert the greatest impact? Great, thank you, uh, thank you for the question. So it, it's interesting that you link together commercial and philanthropy. Um, it's often a difficult uh, challenge that, that pharmaceutical companies have. As I said, drug development costs a lot of money, um, especially in small biotechs that I work in now. Uh, the only way you can pay for that development and, act, and work that needs to be done is through raising money, uh, either through private equity or through the equity markets, buying stock, et cetera. So anytime you do that, um, the people who have invested in your company always expect commercial return, right? Nobody, nobody's gonna invest $100 million with the anticipation of trying to do something good unless you're Bill Gates or Melinda Gates and you've set up foundations to do that. So it is a balance that companies always have to have to, to be careful about. I think you know, most companies you know, set out with the understanding that commercial success also equals uh, healthcare success. Uh, so you know, for me, for example, now working in the field of antibiotics where there's a huge unmet need, you can really tackle both things, right? You wanna develop something that can be successful commercially so you can get the investment and, and ultimately have the drug there, but also try and solve a problem of, of, of public health, and in my case, antibiotic resistance. Thank you. Yeah. And for Mr. Albert, we have a question from Ms. Ainsley Nugent. Mr. Albert, what types of careers are possible for statisticians, and what is the level of demand in the workplace? Is, is a statistical career a lucrative one? Thank you. I mean, I think the, um, there was a famous statistician, his name was John Tukey, and he said one thing that's fun about being a statistician is you get to play everyone else's backyards, which means that you can do consulting in every area, and I would say when you talk about statistics, I would also talk about data science. You can really do literally, you go, to your, go, you go shopping, right? You got this little card that you get scanned. Well, that company could be Kroger or some other companies collecting all sorts of data about your purchase behavior. So that right away, you got tons of data. Think about your browsing on the internet. That's all data. And companies like Google and Facebook are using that data for a lot of purposes. So. We're, we're basically a big data society, and so there's a need for, for people in all fields to start working that. I mean, and so to me, it's a wonderful, to me, statistics is great, and you can, but, but to me, if you have statistics plus programming, the opportunity is just endless. And again, I would never would have thought working for a baseball team, but I say, if you want to do that, I know people who had that passion, and they can do it, so. Thank you very much. And for Mr. Brenner, we have a question from Adam Denofa. Come forward. Um, my question is, what is the biggest risk or obstacle you've encountered getting to where you are now, and what factors helped you make a decision? Great, so thanks again, thanks for the question. So, uh, biggest risks and hurdles. So, oh, round of applause for the question out there. Uh, <laughs> so, pharmaceutical companies are, um, and the industry is actually very degree driven. And uh, you know, advanced degrees in the pharmaceutical industry are uh, almost uh, a necessity to, uh, to advance, to get promotions, to, to you know, continue to climb the, the corporate ladder. So I think early in my career, one of the, the biggest hurdles I had was um, not having an advanced degree. And um, I recognized that early. So uh, you know, during my d early days of working, did go back to school and, and, and get one uh, part time at night to try and uh, help overcome those, uh, those challenges. I think you know, just being aware of the environment uh, what the needs are out there to help make you successful, and then, you know, as I said before, just find a way to, to, to conquer and challenge those, uh, those needs. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for Mr. Albert, Mr. Dalton Carlisle. Mr. Dalton Carlisle. Come on down. In modern baseball, it seems that experts always find new ways to analyze player performance. What traditional statistics do you think are still the most important for measuring individual player success? Thanks. Okay, well I think um, basically when you're a hitter, there's two things that are important. First, you want to get on base, which is very important, and then you basically want to advance runners home, and so you think about the sluggers. And so a traditional way of measuring on base is um, on base percentage, which is a pretty good measure, and then a slugging percentage is a good way of measuring um, your p power, so if you add the two, you get OPS, which is, um, the P stands for plus. You add on-base percentage plus selecting percentage. That's still a pretty good measure, pretty simple to compute, and it, it's meaningful for talking about overall 
performance of a hitter. Thank you. And for Mr. Brenner, Alex Sperka. Alex Sperka. Yeah, so you were talking earlier about the antibiotic resistant drug that your company is trying to develop. What are the most formidable obstacles when you're trying to bring one of these new, innovative, and potentially life-saving drugs to the market? Great, thanks, Alex. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the, since we seem to have a baseball theme going today, um, Indeed. The pharmaceutical development is very much like baseball. Um, it's actually, it's a game of failure, right? So in baseball, you know, if you bat 250, 275, you know, so, you know, 75% of the time you're, you're getting out, 25% of the time you're, you're getting on base. Pharmaceutical development is very much the same, right? So for every 20 or so new products that get discovered, um, with any luck, one or two of them will make it out the other end uh, to become an actual product that, that gets out there. So um, those challenges exist every day. Uh, you're continually working in a field, unlike baseball, that you get sort of immediate award, reward, where you can swing the bat, get a hit or not. Pharmaceutical development is slow, time-consuming, very, very risky, and uh, provides all those hurdles because you can spend lots of time, lots of money, 10 years to get something to, to try and get to the market, only to find something at the end that pops up that derails the whole situation. Thank you. Daunting process. Uh, for Mr. Albert. Oh, could we have Ms. Josie Tassoni? Here we go, Josie. All right. How accurate was the movie Moneyball in depicting Oakland A's manager Billy Bean's use of saver metrics to make decisions about player placement in the batting lineup? Also, how important is payroll as a predictor of team success? I think Moneyball was a real good book in the perspective that it really did promote using analytics in baseball. And it talked a lot about the tension between traditional scouts and the, and the more people scouts who use it, um, used um, stats. But I think it, sort of, it was a bit off the mark in a sense because, for example, Oakland did very well that season and they had a long winning streak, but actually they had some great pitchers. But those pitchers aren't mentioned in the book at all. So in a sense, I mean, it was a little bit off the mark, but I think the, the direction it talked about, it had a great impact. Um, especially the movie, you know, having Brad Pitt play the main character was a good, a good plus. So I think um, now the board Moneyball is used in every context, like you talk about. For example, one area which needs more statistics is crime, okay, or crime, there's really a need for more data analysis, more for data, and it's sort of talking about Moneyballing crime data. So I think there's a, so I'd like, again, I like the full attitude of the book, and I think it may, has made a big difference in how we think about those problems. And uh, just the follow-up part of the question, how, oh, wait. what the influence of money, oh, money as that's a predictor true. Okay. of success. Well, I mean, the Yankees will always will be okay because they always have money to spend. And you have the, it definitely, one problem about baseball is there's a great differences in payroll. And so you have the rich teams like the Yankees and you got the poor teams like the Marlins. But I think that, um, so I think payroll is somewhat reflective of winning. But what's interesting is that you can do a tremendous amount with relatively small payrolls. So I think Oakland, in that 2002 season, they were able to be successful with a small payroll. Now look at the, the Rays. The Rays are doing real well, and that's, they don't have a big payroll. So I think you know, it's, there's still a lot you can do with a small payroll. Thank you very much. And uh, we have, for Mr. Brenner, Chris Oreo. So everyone makes mistakes at one point or another. What mistake over the course of your career may have helped you learn and develop most profoundly? So uh, you're right. Uh, we all make mistakes, um, except me, Deb. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, but no, it's a good question. So you know, I think you learn from a very, very young age that people learn more from their mistakes than they do from not making mistakes. Uh, you see that with young kids you know, when they fall down the steps, they're much more careful to be when they approach the steps next time. When you touch a hot stove, you're much more cautious about touching things hot moving forward. So we do learn a lot from, from mistakes that we've made. Uh, there is one mistake uh, that jumps out at me from, from my career uh, that happened somewhere in the, the late 90s, uh, by the time I was at Wyeth Pharmaceuticals. And uh, the mistake, thankfully, wasn't catastrophic. It didn't um, have an, an old, a big impact on 
the company as a whole or the outcome of a particular product, uh, but it had a very uh, big impact on me. And, and this, the mistake ultimately came down to uh, not asking the tough questions um, and sometimes making too much assumptions of what people will tell you rather than digging a little bit deeper to ask the difficult questions and make sure things are accurate and things are true. So um, I still think about that often. Um, it is something I, I, I do all the time in my uh, everyday life at work, is continue to question, not in a way that you don't trust people and that you don't believe what they're saying, but to continue to question, to educate yourself uh, so you can make better and more informed decisions. And I think that's a, that's a lesson that probably goes well to everybody out here, especially at your age, as you're trying to think about you know, the, the path of your life and, and where you want to go. Um, I always suggest ask questions and learn. Uh, that's the best way to help guide. Thank you so much. The importance of courage. For Mr. Albert, Ben Mascio. Ben. Uh, with all of baseball's shifts, pitching changes, and new approaches, do you think the increased use of statistics on the managerial end is helping or hurting the game? Well, I think um, we saw an example of that uh, last season. We, the Phillies had a new manager, and uh, I think he tended to be extremely analytical, and he tried to make a lot of um, changes, like change pitchers quite a bit for like, matchup comparisons. I think he overdid it. <laughs> because I think sometimes that can be more disruptive. I think you need to let the players play. So I think you have to be informed by analytics, but also there's this, this you, know, you also gotta be, understand how the game is played and be a little more careful. For example, one thing you learn in statistics is that when you have a small sample, that's very unreliable. So you look at picker batters against picker pitchers, they typically are based on small samples. So I would not rely too much on that information. So. So it, it's helpful information, but again, there's a certain compromise, which is really the best thing to do. Thank you so much. Uh, for Mr. Brenner, Alex Kraus. This is gonna be my first baseball question, right? No. no. Um, so what educational pathway could best lead to a career in the pharmaceutical industry? That yeah, really good question, and, and obviously uh, ample time for the, the older kids at, at PW trying to think what they want to do. So as I, I talked a little bit about in my, in my remarks around the, the pharmaceutical industry essentially being an industry amongst itself, my path was very science-based. Um, I started in a research lab. Uh, I do a lot with regards to manufacturing and clinical development and very, very strong biology, chemistry, science-based work. Um, but there's an equally big, important side of the business around uh, commercialization, uh, marketing, business analytics, um, uh, understanding trends in the industry. Um, so there's really no simple answer to that question. I think if you're a science base and you want to go the science based route that I took, obviously uh, chemistry, biology, physics, some science based degree, statistical work is huge in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, everything we do requires analysis and programming of significant amounts of data. Uh, the way we design clinical studies, the way we analyze, analyze Stability data from our, from our manufacturing runs. Mathematics is, a, is an approach you could take. Pure business um, is an approach you could take as well. If you could figure out a way, uh, very similar to what Jim said in his opening remarks, around trying to combine a science with a computer programming or a science with a business uh, to make yourself more well-rounded, um, but at least have a core uh, understanding of a, of a discipline from the education, I think that will help. You see a lot of PharmDs in the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of PhDs in math and science, physicians, uh, et cetera. So th there's really no limit to what you can do. It, it really depends on what field you want to focus in on. Thank you again. And for Mr. Albert, we have Andrew Strickland. Uh, how does one prepare for a career in sports statistics? And on the lighter side, are pitching or batting statistics more important to a team's overall success? Okay, Thank well, I you. think if you, I mean, it's interesting because I participate in, there's a, a statistics or a baseball analytics community, and so I get the opportunity to hear from general managers who actually, you know, basically have jobs for people in analytics. And we ask them, you know, what does it take to get a job for like, say, Cincinnati Reds or something? And what they say is, well, they're interested in students who have the background, you know, maybe have some course, some background in mathematics or statistics or computer science, but really they want, they want a person who can um, pose a good problem, you know, pose an interesting problem about baseball and then 
find the relevant data and work on it and do whatever modeling or descriptive analysis you want to do, and then also have the ability to communicate. Because basically, if you're going to influence the team, you have to talk, you have to explain to the decision makers who don't know much about statistics. So not only do you have to pose good problems, you got to be able to communicate. I think we sometimes underplay the communication part, but it's really important. Also, if you want to get a job, start doing your own work. Start exploring data. data baseball data is free. I use R, which is open source. That's free. I mean, you can do your own work. You can publish your own blog. I mean, you can start, and you can show people what you can do. And I think teams really are impressed by that. So it's more than your coursework. Thank you. Uh, for Mr. Brenner, Sam Matthews. So despite your obvious success, is there any activity you would have pursued if you could turn back the clock to your Plymouth Light Marsh days? Different activities I would have pursued. Um, after hearing from Jim that I could work for a baseball team, I would maybe think about going back and learning a little bit more about <laughs> statistics. But um, I think the one thing that I, I'll hold up air quotes to say I regret about my education um, is that I didn't do what I just answered the previous question about, which was try to do a better balance of science and business. Um, I think as you get out into the, the real world, even if you have a science-based job, understanding the aspects of you know, how companies run, how the market works, how investors invest in companies, what it means to them, uh, and being able to combine that with the, the science and the good work that you do from a science perspective, I think makes any employee or anybody looking for a career path in at least the pharmaceutical industry or a science-based field a, a more well-rounded person. Thank you. And for Mr. Albert, we have our own Mr. Monero. Uh, Dr. Albert, I was reading some of your work um, about home runs. So I was curious what you thought had more value in baseball, strikeouts as a negative value or home runs as a positive value? That's a good question. Um, the, uh, basically, I think about every, everything in the baseball con either contributes runs to the team or takes away runs. And essentially, about 10 runs is equivalent to a win. So basically, yeah, you, when you strike out, you're going to lose runs for the team. But the advantage of a, of a home run is really pretty great. So in a sense, home runs are more, are more positive than strikeouts are negative. And so I think, you know, um, like for example, the Phillies are, they're willing to let Bryce strike out a few times <laughs> if he gets some home runs. And so I think, um, and I think now strikeouts are a little more accepted because they understand that goes along with the trying to hit for home runs. Thank you. And for our last official question of the day, we have Mr. Jacob Davis for Randall Brenner. Jacob Davis. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my question for you is, what long-standing health threat do you believe has the greatest chance of eradication in the near future, and by what means? Thanks, Jacob. Uh, eradication is a, in my field, is a really difficult word. Um, so for those who may not know it, uh, essentially what it means is you're ridding the world of a disease, uh, which is an extremely high hurdle. And uh, so to eradicate um, polio or some other uh, illness that, that no longer exists today really was a work of some terrific vaccines. Uh, the vaccines world is, is really your, generally your best approach to do some eradication. Uh, you see some today some gene therapy where companies, the uh, company right here that came out of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia called Spark um, was able to do genetic editing to actually change genes to uh, give people who couldn't, could not see actually the ability to see. So they eradic they're eradicating some, some illnesses by uh, manipulating genes and really changing the, changing the, the landscape of science. Um, so eradication is a, is, a, is a hard thing to do. Um, I think there are a number of vaccines companies that are out there looking at other ways to eradicate uh, illnesses. Uh, certainly the, the work that my company does um, in trying to treat illnesses and cure diseases, a little bit different than eradication, um, and the antibiotic space has uh, the potential to work in a, in a way like eradication that could be used uh, around the world for, for patients like us um, in developed worlds who need it, but also in patients in, in the uh, non-developed worlds who are limited to antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, thank you both for answering these questions and for being here to share your experience with us. Dr. Bacani, do we have any extra time at all to ans ask any questions informally or 
Extra, a few minutes? Okay, fantastic. Two minutes, got it. Uh, first, before I do, uh, are there any questions answered that any of our questioners off the top of their head uh, thought they would like to ask a follow-up question to, just off the top of your head? Uh, all right, I just want to make sure uh, before I pose a question of my own, if I could, and, and the first one would go to Mr. Albert, if that's okay. You had mentioned earlier applying st statistics to criminality. I think you mentioned that somewhere along, or you mentioned criminal somewhere along the line. And I wasn't going to ask about that specifically, but I was wondering, since we're talking so much today about statistics as it applies to baseball, whether you ever wondered uh, that if, you know, if the universe is abstractly made up of number, and I don't know whether it is, whether the, you've wondered if there's another problem or another field or another discipline where you wish statistics was m brought to greater bear upon that discipline or upon that problem? Well, okay, here's a very simple example. Um, fingerprints, because often fingerprints are used to identify you know, criminals. You know, they're used in court cases. Yes. And what usually happens is that they'll have some expert witness will come up and say, these fingerprints match. Now, as I'm a statistician, I know that any time you make a measurement, could be observation, there's error <laughs> associated with that. So for just somebody to say that these, these fingerprints match, how do I know to believe that? Now, I don't know. So basically what you need is you need some quantification. You need some way of understanding what makes a fingerprint. You gotta understand how that varies. So I mean, there's an area where statistical analysis should be a natural thing, but it's very slowly coming into play. I see. Yeah, so. All right, well, thank you very much. And Mr. Berner, if you don't mind, uh, as, as, as sports-minded as you are and as involved in multiple games, is there anything in your sports experience that you think most contributed to your overall success? Um, I heard a chuckle from the audience when uh, Coach Wadlin said he, he wasn't the most athletic or wasn't the most talented uh, basketball <laughs> player on the court, um, <clears throat> but, the, it, but he was always the smartest. And, um, you know, I think leadership, uh, sports intelligence, uh, et cetera, easily carries over into life. Um, and I think, you know, things you learn early in sports around teamwork, leadership, um, you know, all those skills that you can take from, from working with colleagues and friends and teams and then bring that into college, your professional life, the way people work together uh, certainly mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is a lesson I think people can learn and can benefit from. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. And Dr. Bacani. Say one more big round of applause for Dr. Albert and Mr. Brenner. Congratulations. And at this time, I'd like to call up the PW Acapellas, please, to close with our alma mater. Everyone can please stand for the alma mater. Thank you. Phenomenal job. Thank you.